still cold. That place is strong, but the dark side of the force. No bad methods. You will not need them. Hey folks, welcome to The Broken Meeple, I'm Luke Hector, and this is a bonus review for you. Well, bonus one of two reviews for you. I'm also going to be doing Sentinels of the Multiverse Oblivion in the near future, but first I wanted to get out this little gem for many people, which is Brass Lancashire. The reason I say Brass Lancashire is because technically I'm going to do a review for both, because, uh, well, we'll get onto the reasons why, but this is for Brass Birmingham here and Brass Lancashire here. The vast majority of this is going to be based on uh, the Lancashire version, but, um, well, we'll get onto this later. So, my history with Brass is, uh, sketchy to say the least. You know, Martin Wallace, I have met the guy, I've had dinner with him, and he's such a friendly bloke. I love the dude, he's really friendly, really nice, really chatty. But his games have never sung well with me. <laughs> not one of them. It's not a case of saying they're bad designs, it's just the themes are usually not ones I go for, and if they are, they're usually pushed to one side in, in the favour of the mechanics, and then the mechanics themselves just don't seem to gel with me. I don't know what it is. I was never a fan of the whole Age of Industry thing, Via Nebula just felt dry and unassuming, and the less said about Study and Emerald, the better. But Brass, with me, had a different history. Because everybody was touting this as like this amazing economic Euro game. And granted, economic Euro games are not normally my thing. But I thought, well, I'll give it a try. Anybody own it? No. Okay, so how am I going to try it? I decided to go on the iOS app and try that one. Big mistake. <laughs> because firstly, the app is horrendous. It looks exactly like the board game version. But that's not a good thing. The old board game, you have to admit, looks horrible. But on top of that, it has the worst rules teaching and tutorial system ever that I have seen on an app. It does not, I mean, there's, there's not holding your hand and then there's dumping you in a forest on an abandoned island surrounded by sharks and giving you a stick. It really does nothing to teach you the game or give you any hints as to how you play or do well. So my experience with the app was horrendous. I didn't enjoy the game at all. And at that point I was just like, yeah, screw this, don't care. Then Rocks the Game came along, and they did Santorini, which is a really great abstract game, and, you know, they they don't have much in their catalogue, but the ones that they have are generally very popular, and they do seem to be very good at, you know, aesthetics. They really put effort into making it look good without costing the ends of the earth. Always a good combination. And so their big one that everyone was talking about was a reprint of Brass. So I figured... You know what? The Kickstarter wasn't that expensive. It was only about, what, like 132 Canadian dollars, which worked out about 80 pound, 75 pound. And I thought, for two games, that's pretty good value. And even if I don't necessarily like them that much, I can always sell them on to someone who wants the game even more. So I thought, you know what? I'll go for it. I'll give it another chance. And so, here they are. Brass Lancashire and Brass Birmingham. I have now tried them both. And, you know, I can give a decent review here. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, oh my god, I'm going to rag on this game and say I hate it. Not true. What? Yeah, I know. Shocking, huh? Although, I'm not exactly saying it's perfect either. So in Brass, you, in, in Lancashire specifically, you are in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, in that time when, you know, everything was, to start with, being transported by canals, and then eventually, you know, railroads took over, became the new thing, and so you're developing industries on the map in order to, you know, gain money and also score the most victory points. Big shock there. But the idea is, is that these industries, cotton mills and coal mines and ironworks, are basically, they're put on the board to begin with, and you have money in order to do so. But in order to get more money, you either have to take loans, or you have to flip your tiles in order to gain an income stream from them. The best way to flip them, though, is in most cases, to have either yourself or other players flip them for you. 
because with coal and ironworks, they come with coal and iron cubes on them, but as soon as they're drained of cubes, they flip. You get the victory points and you get the income stream. With the cotton mills, if you flip it, either by selling to a distant market or flipping yours or someone else's port, for example, the port generates income and victory points, so does the cotton mill. There's a big sort of a, almost like a back and forth between all the players in a very tactical aspect as to whether you're going to take advantage of industries and resources that your opponents have, even though you know it helps them a bit as well. If it helps you more, that's the idea. And um, essentially this carries on over two eras where each turn you are playing two actions using a hand of cards. These cards are locations or they're industry based. And playing these cards allows you to build in specific locations or specific industries or discard them in general to do other actions like taking loans, building network lines, that sort of thing. So it's not quite multi-use cards. You know, there's one or two uses for each, but that's about it. But the idea is, is that you always have to discard these cards because the deck runs as a timer for the game and the cards stipulate where you've got choices to build. So you are somewhat restricted by what cards you have in your hand and you have to use them strategically and tactically in order to react to what your opponents are doing on the map and also what your game plan is. This carries on over two eras, a canal era and a rail era, at which point during the middle of the game when the canal era finishes, obsolete technology and industries go off the board and you essentially start off again from a railroad era where you have some tweaks to the gameplay. This carries on until eventually the deck runs out twice, you total up all the victory points, most wins, you know, job done. It's your very standard sort of economic Euro game in that fact. You've got the material, you've got the resources to manage, you've got the money to manage, how are you best gonna, you know, build, when are you gonna build, where are you gonna build, what's the best way to do it? This is definitely a deep game, but more on that later. So the first obvious thing is, well, the aesthetics. Just look at this. Woo! <laughs> as much as people will, you know, say that the old brass is amazing and stuff like that, come on. I mean, I know it's subjective, but the old one looks terrible. The sort of like Game Boy Color-esque desert yellow and blue on that board, it just looks so dry and dated the old version. It's like, I did not like the look of it at all. This though, oh my god, this is beautiful. So beautiful. This, I want this artwork in other games. <laughs> Seriously. The box cover alone made me think, shall I give this one another chance? It's that good, a box cover. It just looks so detailed, so almost life realistic. Kudos to the artist who did this. This is absolutely amazing. And it continues throughout the rest of this box. They really put effort into this. The board looks great with a decent map of Lancashire and the various industries and cities. You can see little bits of detail in there. It's a bit dark and that has put off a few people. It could have maybe been brightened up. I mean, I know it's the Industrial Revolution, but come on, a tiny bit of sunlight maybe? It makes it hard to spot a few things on the board, but they're minor nitpicks. But you've got the great artwork on the cards and it, you've got decent cardboard chits. You've got a nice finish on the box. And depending on whether you've got the Kickstarter or the normal version, you've either got decent sort of cardboard chip money or you've got those iron clay poker chips. Now, this one has those poker chips as a Kickstarter version, but and as gorgeous as those chips are, understand that the difference between the retail and the Kickstarter version are purely cosmetic. It's just slightly upgraded components in the box and the cards and that, and the iron clay poker chips. That's it. There are no other exclusives, there are no other changes to the rules or anything like that. You still get the board, you still get the rules. It's, you know, it's purely cosmetic as the way Kickstarter really should be done. And now I'm getting sick and tired of all these exclusives where they give you like exclusive expansions and exclusive rules. No, no, just make them cosmetic and that's all well. But 10 out of 10 for production here. It looks great on the table. People come round and are instantly hooked as to what you're doing. They don't, they've never even heard of the game before but they wanna know just because it looks that good. And with the chips as well, you know, in the Kickstarter case and all the cards, even if you're sat there waiting for your turn, you've got something to look at and marvel. So can't say enough praise about how good this looks. And certainly if you're gonna give me a, you know, a, a boring theme, yeah, you know, if you're gonna give me a boring theme, at least make it look good. And I say boring theme as a subjective matter. Some people love the whole historical aspect, you know, the Industrial Revolution, and I'm not gonna say this is dry. No, 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 no. They've actually put some effort into the theme here because 
you know, they, they mention in the rule book specific areas like you are using canals in the first half and you can take your iron from anywhere on the board because iron was transported in small quantities, it could be done in horse and cart. And then it mentions later on with the coal that in order to use the coal, you've got to have a direct network link in order to do it because coal had to be transported in large quantities. And there's other aspects like the map of Lancashire is, from what I can tell, reasonably accurate, although I'm not the uh, biggest expert on Yang Lancashire. The personalities that are used, you know, they've got historical backgrounds on them. So they have paid attention to the theme as the, as the old one did. And, you know, there is theme here. In a sense, I mean, you could have made this a space game on a distant planet and traded different resources and probably come up with the same sort of concept, but this setting works. And the, the theme is brought out as well in the aesthetics, you know, that is an improvement. But I say theme being boring, because just for me personally, oh great, another Euro where you buy and sell industries, coal, iron, yay. It's not a theme I go for. Hence, it was a bit of a struggle for me to get back into this, but I kind of just let the theme slide and decided that, you know what, yeah, it's not a theme I go for, but it looks good. Let's try the mechanics out and really get deep into this game. And I say deep, not in quote unquotes. This is a deep game. You are not, you, do, you don't have your hand shook here. You know, there is no like big mentor or something just taking you by the hand and walking you into this game. No, this one literally dumps you in the ocean and expects you to, to manage. It's definitely a heavy game. Do not recommend it for gateway gamers at all. Not the sense that the rules are complex, although you do have a fair amount to teach. You gotta teach five actions, you gotta teach uh, two of them in particular, the build and sell are quite intricate. You've gotta teach what happens when you consume coal, consume iron, you've gotta understand the difference between connected and in, in your network. And then on top of that, once you've even got all the rules down, how to actually do well in this game is, well, you find out. <laughs> the rule book gives you very few tips on how to do well. It gives you a couple of tips on how not to do stupid, <laughs> but some of them are quite self-explanatory and again, they just stop you making catastrophic mistakes. Like for example, not uh, getting rid of level one technologies before the end of the canal era. As soon as you explain the rule that they all go off the board, you can kind of figure that out for yourself. But, you know, where should I build? Should I start there? Should I build stuff next to each other? Um, he's building ports. Should I build a mill then and use his port? I don't know. Uh, is it good to connect to the outside? Uh, should I just focus on one particular industry and just munchkin that? Will that work? You've no idea. And the game makes no effort to help you along that fact. It's going to take you at least one game to get the rules in place and understand what's going on. It's probably going to take you another two or three to really understand, okay, this is how to do well, or this is how not to make a complete hash of it. And that's good and bad. If you're into these deep heavy Euros, then you'll love this. You know, you'll love the fact that it forces you to really think and sort of get into the, I say deep strategy. I feel this is more tactical than strategy, but more on that later. Um, but I would have liked maybe a little bit of extra hand holding, just a little bit of the rule book, just to explain a few proper hints and tips, because I'm all up for having a challenge, but just prod me in the right direction in places, please. <laughs> you know, it can be quite frustrating for someone who's played it, has no idea what they're getting into, and suddenly it's like, oh, um, what do I do? What do I do? Oh, oh you guys are getting all this stuff, and I'm um, just sit here then. And it can be quite disconcerting. In terms of the uh, player count and downtime and length, hit and miss. This one goes from two to four players. And there are rules for two, three, and four, slightly tweaked. And there's also a community variant for two players. That community variant for two players is actually pretty sweet. I actually prefer it to the normal two player. And the other side of the board has a specific map layout for that variant. It's really cool and I prefer that way with the two players. Free is definitely my sweet spot though. Yeah, I know, broken record. But, you know, free gives you a little bit of interaction with different players as you're sort of competing for spaces and it's quite mean. <laughs> this is a very mean game. Uh, but free players just sort of also gives that nice length of downtime and length and keeps it to about two hours, two and a bit, two and a half tops. And that's a decent enough length for a game like this. Four players, I don't think I'd want to play this with four players again, unless everybody knew what they were doing. Four players, for me, every time I've tried it, especially with the I'm teaching, just takes too long. It goes above the three hour mark. And for a game like this, where I'm not that engrossed into the theme, I don't want to play it for three hours. And during that three hours, your downtime is quite high because you're kind of dictated by the cards, 
but you've also got the board state changing quite dramatically at times, depending on what your opponents do. So you can plan ahead, but then if your opponent builds where you want to build, well, then you've got to think again. And everybody has to do the two actions, and if you're selling stuff, then that takes a bit longer. It's The downtime is just a bit too much in four players, and over three hours for gameplay. I know some people can do it in less, but, you know, I find four is just a bit too long. However, some people really love it. I hear that four player is the sweet spot for the amount of, you know, cutthroat meanness in the game. And I suppose that's another slight put off I have. I don't want it to be too cutthroat. With four players, I found that you tend to get a runaway leader and one person is really at the back with no chance of winning and he's kind of screwed over at every opportunity. The board does scale slightly for, um, you know, the player count, but not enough. You add, what, like two cities in between three and four players? That's not enough extra space to warrant fourth person, you know, going after various spots. And it just, everything gets filled up. And again, you might like that. You want confrontation. You want, you know, meanness. You want to, like, get in before someone else can and steal what they were planning to do. Then go for this. <laughs> You'll love it. That's just not kind of my style of Euro. But, you know, that's a personal preference. With regards to the tactics and strategy thing I mentioned slightly earlier, it's a bit of both. You do sort of strategically think, right, I'm going to go here, I'm going to do this, or you might plan something for the, the game, like, I'm going to focus on iron. But the cards might not allow you to do that. And this goes on to a bit of flaw I have, which I'll get onto later. But I feel this is more tactical. And that's a good thing. I quite enjoy the tactical aspect of this, where you need to react to what your opponents are doing. So they've built in Bolton. Well, he's built a mill there. If I build a port nearby, maybe he'll use that. Or the market is slightly drained on iron. Well, I wasn't planning to go into iron, but if I build an ironworks now, then all the cubes get sucked into the market, I get money, it flips, great, that's a good opportunity. So that's kind of what brass is about. It's not so much saying I'm gonna focus on iron. I know that's what I tend to do in games. I pick a theme and I go with it no matter what. And I did that in my first game. Didn't matter whether I was going to win or not. I just said, I'm going to build all my coal and iron works and see what happens. And I did win, just. But, you know, it's not the best strategy in this game to suddenly say, yeah, from the start, I'm going to try this. Because you might not be able to. But you want to spot those opportunities where somebody has built where you think you might be able to profit more than they will. Or you can take that snip at the market or sell that cotton before that person does. And there's a lot of reactionary moves that you must do. Is that the word? Oh, well, whatever. So I like that aspect. That's probably the best thing I like about the game. It's, it feels fluid. It doesn't seem to grind to a halt, you know, things that go in motions and you always got to be on your toes. You can't sit back and, you know, take a breather. You need to be alert because you might miss something with another player. And because the turn order keeps changing based on your money spent, you might accidentally screw yourself over with a bad decision based on just simply, oh, I spent too much. Now he's going to go first and now he's going to nick that space before me. Oh, you know, it hurts. And this is quite punishing. But at least, you know, you know for next time. And note that it is punishing. If you get kicked about in the first round, you're done. You ain't going to catch up. You know, you can have a slightly worse first round compared to someone else maybe. But if you did really bad in the first round chances are you're done with the second round. And that is a bit of a flaw, pseudo knockout. I don't like that in games. Although it's not as obvious that you're going to get pseudo knocked out, at least not until you're already halfway through the game anyway. So it's not too bad. But yeah, as I mentioned, you know, if you're in that position where it's like, oh, I had a really sucky first round and you got miles ahead. Well, it's not like he's going to have that sucky a second round, you know, because he's got the foundation from the first round to do well. So it's a bit like that. Scores have been quite close, though, at least with the two winning players in each game. So, you know, you can get some very tense finishes. But again, two people at the top and at least one or two people miles behind who might as well have not really been there. It's a hit and miss affair, but, you know, some people want that in their Euros and fair play. One aspect I do have a little bit of problem with is the cards themselves. The cards are an interesting concept in theory. The fact that you have a hand of cards and you're deciding which industry one do I build, you know, using that one, or which card location do I use. But I think this adds a bit too much luck to the game for how long and deep it is. You can mitigate the luck, the luck of the card draw to an extent by playing two cards and doing a double action, but considering you don't have that many actions in the game when you think about it, you really don't want to be wasting your time doing double actions unless it's absolutely necessary. So, you know, doing a double action constantly is going to set you back 
compared to someone else who has been lucky enough to have exactly the cards they want. And the last game I played, I remember drawing a hand of eight cards. Six of them were industry ones. You can only use those to build in areas that are part of your network. Great, except we were so clustered together because it was four players that there was very little places to build. And the ones where I could build weren't much use. Yay, I can build an extra port or a ship. I'm not going for ports and ships, I need the other ones. So suddenly I've got a bunch of dead wood in my hand that I can discard for other actions, but then I'm still left with the industry tiles. Where's my, you know, where's my uh, brewery card? Where's my Lancaster card, you know? And then the player after you, when you're thinking, oh, I want to go there, but I can't, suddenly plays the Lancaster card and does exactly what you were planning to do. Well, was, oh, well lucky you, you happen to have the Lancaster card. It's a bit of a, a ball ache I have with this. You know, it's not like drastically lucky or random. No, I'm not going with that. You can mitigate it and it sort of balances, but... Again, you always get that feeling that somebody just picked up better cards than you did, or picked up the exact card they needed. It's like, oh, we've got to the end of the game and there's only one place to build, you know, well, oh, you just happen to have that card in your hand, you know, it's, it's one of those sort of occasions. I wish maybe they'd done some other means, you know, maybe not had the card system and tried something else, or maybe just added another way to mitigate it more. But like I say, it's, it's a small issue I have, and some people aren't too fussed about it, but there is definitely an aspect of luck in the game, despite how deep it is, and that might put off some people who don't want any aspect of luck in their three hour plus, you know, economic Euro extravaganza. With Brass Birmingham, and the reason I was combining this review was because essentially what they did was Brass Lancashire was the original, and Brass Birmingham was a new one that they've done for this particular Kickstarter. It sets it in Birmingham, and 90% it's the same game. You know, most people have been asking, you know, how do you compare Lancashire to Birmingham? Which one do you prefer? If I was to say which one I prefer, I think I... I slightly prefer Lancashire for being a little bit more streamlined and easy to do than this one is, but I still think this is, you know, solid enough. Essentially what it does, it adds a sixth action that allows you to get some wild cards, which is, you know, Minor, not big deal. The main change with this is obviously a new layered map and the fact that you have beer that you are required to manage as well as coal and iron in order to sell your cotton and do various things. So there's one or two extra rules that allow you to build breweries and you know you need to have beer in order to sell certain stuff. But apart from that, the other actions, what you're doing in the game, building the industries, developing, building network links, it's pretty much identical to this. So it kind of boggles my mind that they didn't just simply put this in a bigger box, give you this board, and essentially like gave you the variant rules in the box and maybe just an extra bag of components for the uh, brewery tiles and that. You could have easily just made this one deluxe box and just added those components in and probably kept the cost down. You wouldn't need a whole extra box to, you know, for another chunk of game or something. They're that similar. This is definitely a harder one to play though than uh, Lancashire. Lancashire, I mean, Lancashire is not easy, but it's certainly out of the two. If you're asking which one is harder, Birmingham, definitely. Mainly because you've got to manage that third aspect, not just coal and iron, now you've got the beer to contend with. But it's a decent, you know, the map looks probably actually more gorgeous than the Lancashire one actually, to be perfectly frank. And you know, if you want that extra challenge or you just wanted an extra variant to spice up your brass experience, then go grab Birmingham as well. Or grab Birmingham instead of Lancashire. You know, if you're done and dusted with Lancashire and you just want to get one, grab Birmingham. Extra challenge, different variant, why not? It's, you know, it's all good variety at the end of the day. So after coming to Brass from, <laughs> let's face it, a pretty scary first encounter, what do I think of it now? It's decent. Honestly. I think it's a decent game. This is not one that I'm probably going to hang on to, though. Uh, a friend of mine is probably going to take this off me. But... I can respect this game. I enjoyed the majority of my time with it. There are aspects that I just, they do rub me the wrong way. I really don't care about this theme. You know, the luck of the cards is a bit of a ball ache and I don't like it with four players, which means I'm kind of restricted to three player because I'm not going to often get this to the table with two. And, you know, and like I say, economic euros are not generally my thing. But I have to give this respect. I don't think it's a bad design at all. I, you know, I thought it was very deep. I like the tactical aspect of it. I think that's the best thing. Aesthetically, this edition is a gorgeous. You know, if you want your Euros to look good, then look no further. And generally, the gameplay is entertaining. 
you know, subject to what I've already mentioned. So I'm glad I got to try it again, both versions. You know, if I'd left it at just my first encounter with the old edition, you'd be like, Ugh, you know, two out of ten, really don't like this game. At least with now, I got to play it, I get to respect it. Granted, I'm not sure about 35 on Board Game Geek, but then I never trusted the rankings on that anyway. But certainly I think, you know, if you're going to put this high in your, you know, top 10 euros list or, you know, you're high in your top 10 deep long euros list, then I'd be perfectly happy for you to have Brass on there. I think it's a decent game. I think any fans of Brass are going to go nuts for this new edition. And I think any heavy euro fans who never got a chance to play the old Brass while it was out of print can now pick up this for not too expensive. I mean, what, we're talking 50 pounds in uh, 45 to 50 pounds in retail version. Not the cheapest game around, no, but for artwork as good as this and decent components, it's not that bad a deal. And if you got this on Kickstarter, you got a bargain. So, yeah, overall, I like it. Probably, as I can only really go as high as a six for me. It's meh. You know, I enjoy my time, but it's not something I'm going to seek out on a regular basis. But if somebody brings it to a night and, you know, everybody else is busy and they say, you know, we've got a spot for brass, do you want to play? I'll probably play it. It's something that I will play if it's on the table. I'm just not really going to keep it, and I'm not going to actively say to someone, bring Brass, please, because I really want to play that. So, you know, respect. Kudos to Brass. Not my favourite game ever. Probably not really meant for me, but I think any fans of this game, fans of the genre, or anybody even curious about this kind of thing who loves economic Euros, going to go crazy for it, and I can understand why. So, that's my opinion on Brass, Lancashire and Birmingham. If you like what you see, please subscribe to the channel. Hope this video wasn't too long for you. There was quite a lot to talk about. And I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple Review. But remember, even if this is your favourite game of all time, just remember, I gave it as good a review as I can. It's only a game. Alright? Take care. See you next time, guys.